Good morning, good afternoon, good whatever or wherever you are. This is uh, Mark Weber from Silicon Valley and uh, Field Fisher's Silicon Valley office. Next webinar today on generative AI and privacy risks and the challenges. Um, we could go deep and into many other issues of this particular technology, but we're going to stick at privacy at least for now. And um, I'm really pleased that uh, today I'm joined by a number of colleagues um, uh, together with me in the room today. We've got Richard Lorne here on the team in Silicon Valley. We've got Andrea Ortega and Pardi Dahova, um, sorry, Dahoya. And um, we're, we're all here to yeah, talk to you today um, about generative AI and all of the things that we've been seeing because we're spending a lot of time with you, our clients, and a number of deals and different uh, um, yeah, discussions that are emerging because, you know, as we say on this slide, it's something that everybody is talking about. And we've got a few headlines here. But um, just for those of you who are thinking generative AI, what's the difference with AI? What are we talking about? Well, generative AI um, really hit the headlines probably before Christmas. Um, we've all been experimenting with it uh, with it since. With, um, but essentially, it's um, another AI algorithm, an artificial intelligence algorithm, which is trained on massive sets of often public data. Um, and these data sets and the learning derived from these data sets is used to generate new content. Um, examples could be text with chat GPT. Um, if you haven't played with it, you really should. Could be visual content with uh, products like Stable Diffusion and Dal E, speech uh, with Whisper, um, Search with Sydney. There are a number of different tools out there. Then, of course, the uh, the the really big players are, are in this too. Google's Bard, uh, interest interesting, launched in you know, a, a little bit of a, a flurry of advertising and some errors around uh, you know what it was quoting on space travel, but it caught our attention. Microsoft's Bing chatbot soon to be introduced into the majority of search engines uh, in the in the Microsoft suite, and you know able you know that's something that we're able to use and play with right now. But all of this generative AI is essentially input-output based technology. We can ask a question, we can ask for a summary, we can ask for a description, um, and they can spit out text, it can spit out images, it can spit out code or even have a chat or a conversation with us. And because of that, it's getting widespread attention. Um, you can do your homework with it. You can do your research with it. You can decide um, on you know, how to run S, you know, SEO or how to optimize uh, a marketing message. There's a lot of different practical uses. And a number of businesses, including a number of our clients, are running to incorporate that within their, techno uh, within their technology. Now, We'll go on to talk about some of the considerations today from a privacy perspective. Um, and there are, of course, broader ethical and legal issues around these tools. We're not here to talk about AI and copyright infringement. There's plenty on the Field Fisher website and other content on that. There's fake news, there's deep, fake, deep fakes and disinformation. Um, we've got obvious issues of bias and discrimination, or at least the potential for bias and discrimination. And um, we will come on to touch about touch on about that. Uh, but also, as we see a number of mounting companies building AI into their um, product stacks and um, into their solutions, we're also seeing yeah, the beginnings of the legal consequences. Uh, web scraping uh, challenges to Microsoft, GitHub and OpenAI, all you know, accused of AI, you know, um, AI tools sort of scraping and using other people's data. Uh, and other lawsuits um, alleging different kinds of scraping from the internet is infringing rights and uh, and copyright and yeah you know, the kind of thing we're all keen to use the tool but we're not necessarily thinking about what's under the hood we're not necessarily thinking about the consequences and there are a number of consequences and of course there isn't just one product out there there are there are many but with employees beginning to use these tools to use their jobs independent contractors accelerating and using these to accelerate what they do. Um, I talk about you know, kids, I've got two teenage kids who've been playing with it too, you know, potential for, for use, potentials for abuse, 
um, and a number of businesses integrating it. And we've spoken to a number of our clients, some of you on the calls today, um, who have been integrating and working on this. Um, the, the, the one kind of final thing I say, we should say, is you know, lots of lots of news, lots of potential. Um, one very early consequence in the privacy world um, in in Italy, and uh, the Garante, the uh, regulator in Italy, um, came out with a uh, yeah, fairly prominent piece of enforcement against a business called Replica AI last month in February. The Italian DPA issued a decision against the AI-powered chatbot replica, essentially opposing a temporary ban on the platform from processing the personal data of Italian users. Somewhat knee-jerk reaction to, uh, yeah, to, to ban and stop use, but they had concerns around the lack of age verification, um, the cr potential creation for inappropriate responses for children. And part of that was around the fact this AI-powered chatbot was launched as a virtual friend, hoping to improve the user's mood and emotional welfare. But this was a tool aimed at children and possibly hadn't had the scrutiny, didn't have the transparency and didn't have all the answers within its services. So in a rush to launch, the Italian DPA jumped on it, stopped it and, uh, and, and killed that business um, with, a, with a, basically a, a deadline to comply and requirements to go rethink and to uh, to relaunch in a different way if they're coming to market. So consequence there on something that was perhaps rushed and not thought about, thought about. Here in the US, FTC enforcement on algorithmic disgorgement more recently against a couple of companies that have been using deceptive data practices as the FTC alleged to build their AI models. And essentially the consequences of the FTC, they were required as companies to destroy the so-called ill-gotten data and the models built with that data, and again, back to square one. So um, while there's the, there's the hype and the potential, and I think here at Field Fisher, we really do see the potential, um, this is something that's not going to go away. This is something which many have been commenting on. It could be the iPhone moment of 2023. Remember, the iPhone came out and we never looked back. Perhaps generative AI came out this year and we'll never have looked back. So here to stay lots to do we're not here to knock it we're just here to give you some ideas about how to go and adopt it and uh, some of the risks and consequences of that adoption so um as everyone's talking about it let's have phil fisher talk about it a little and i'll uh, i'll pass over to richard to have a little bit think about ai governance and you know what we're looking at from a legal and uh, regulatory framework around this new technology Great, thanks Mark. Yeah, so before we talk about some of the privacy risks and challenges of generative AI, we thought it would be worth taking a couple of minutes to look at how AI is regulated and governed today. And it's important to remember that actually, currently there are relatively few laws that directly regulate AI. So you're probably aware that the EU is gonna be introducing its own Artificial Intelligence Act which will be a risk-based framework looking at the development, deployment and use of AI systems within the EU. That law is currently in draft and there are a lot of discussions and scrutiny around um, that proposal. And the most recent discussions and versions of the law are looking at how to account for generative AI as well and which laws should apply. Um, it's possible that that law will be finalized this year, maybe in the, the latter part of this year, or potentially next year. But it's on its way, and it's, there's still a lot of discussion and moving pieces around that legislation. Now, there are similar attempts to introduce federal law in the US around the use of AI systems. And in 2022, there was a bill introduced to Congress around algorithmic accountability. But I think it's fair to say that federal law um, is probably uh, still a little ways off and we may not see that law actually um, be agreed and enter into the books in the next year or two. So that's still very much at the proposal stage. But apart from that, we do have an increasing number of more focused sectoral laws around artificial intelligence within specific domains and contexts. So for instance, there are uh, an increasing number of local laws governing the use of AI in an employment or recruitment context, and also the regulation of AI within healthcare, financial services, and other regulated industries. 
Now, for generative AI, um, it's feasible that some of these targeted laws may become relevant, depending on the use case and which sector or industry you're operating in. Um, but in the absence of any hard laws, what we might really be thinking about is guidance. And there is a wealth of guidance that's been issued by regulators, including by EU data protection authorities, on artificial intelligence. So one notable example is the UK ICO. They have published um, quite, quite detailed and comprehensive guidance around how artificial intelligence should be interpreted and also uh, regulated from a data protection perspective. The guidance is online in English, it's quite accessible, um, and there's lots to read there. Um, a lot of this guidance isn't necessarily binding, but it's a good indication of how regulators view this technology and how some of uh, the, the steps that companies should be taking to address their compliance responsibilities. Otherwise, while we've also seen that the explosion in generative AI recently, we've also seen an absolute proliferation in terms of self-regulation. So this involves codes or frameworks um, around the ethical and responsible use of AI. And generally speaking, these are non-binding but voluntary frameworks for how AI should be adopted. These include self-regulation at the multilateral level, so things like the OECD principles that have been adopted by OECD countries, but also um, guidelines and guides issued by um, governments and, and public agencies. So uh, the White House actually issued its own AI bill um, of rights last year, and that's intended to provide guidance both for uh, public uh, body and agencies, but also the private sector on what are the principles that should guide your use of artificial intelligence. More commonly though, we have self-regulation within the private sector. And um, a vast number of companies that have published and adopted their own frameworks for artificial intelligence. Google, Microsoft, Meta, just to name a few. One thing I'd call out there is there are also some collaborative and cross-industry initiatives as well. So we have um, the PIA, which is um, the Partnership on AI's Responsible Practices for Synthetic Media. So that's specifically around generative AI. That's a framework that was very recently published and it's been adopted by a group of around 10 companies so far, including OpenAI and some others. Um, it's fair to say we're going to see a lot more to come and that this is a huge growth space. Um, alongside some of those um, more ethical and responsible based frameworks, we also have uh, new technical standards coming in. So, for instance, in January, uh, NIST released a voluntary AI risk management framework, and that's um, really up there to help organizations that are designing, developing, and using AI systems, including to enhance the trustworthiness of those systems and to address bias and privacy concerns. So those have more of a, a technical gloss and provide a more um, practical and technical framework for companies to address some of the risks here. Now, while this slide is considering um, laws and frameworks that apply directly to AI, obviously there's a wealth of law that uh, may indirectly regulate the use of AI and generative AI in particular. And as Mark mentioned earlier, that could include consumer protection or intellectual property, competition, but also privacy law. So for the rest of today's session, we're going to be focusing on um, the risks and challenges of generative AI in the context of privacy law, including the GDPR. Right, so the first question to consider is, well, how does the GDPR actually apply to generative AI? And there are two questions we think you should, you should be asking yourselves. The first one is, well, what's the data? And does our use case involve the processing of personal data? So let's think about how gen generative AI operates. Now, very roughly speaking, generative AI creates or generates content, you know, text, image, or audio outputs um, based on a, a huge amount of data that those systems have been trained on using machine learning, natural language processing, and algorithmic processing. And the technology essentially is able to predict the next word um, based on a previous word sequence or the next pixel based on a previous um, pixel. 
and therefore create or generate um, word sequences or new images. And those models can also be fine-tuned for particular use cases. So, for instance, you might have a large language model, but then you fine-tune it for biomedical use or within a marketing context, and sometimes even within a legal context, depending on how you want to use those models. Um, so, when we're thinking about privacy in the GDPR, we've got to think about what's the type of data involved. Are we thinking about uh, text, images, audio, video, and could that data potentially capture or include any personal data? We're also thinking about the role that the data plays within a generative AI, and there are essentially three buckets. The first, um, as I mentioned, is the training data. So that's the huge corpus of data that was involved in actually training the model to begin with. And generally speaking, it's the AI developer, the tech developer, somebody like OpenAI, who is going to be involved in actually the training element of this technology. But if you're looking to use um, this technology for a specific use case, potentially you're also involved in training that data. For instance, if you're looking to fine tune the model and therefore you're either involved or responsible for additional training. And then the second bucket is once we've trained the system and now want to use it, we're also thinking about the input data that's going to be fed in as a prompt to the system. And that potentially could be based on text, or it could also be images that you're providing into generative AI, um, and that could capture personal data as well. And then the system evaluates, and based on its training and the input, it's going to generate a response or the output data. And again, is it possible that that output could include personal data too? Now, we know that uh, information that is derived or inferred about a particular individual could be also considered personal data under the GDPR. So similarly, information that is synthetically created or generated by an artificial intelligence system, that could also potentially be personal data to the extent that it relates to a particular individual. And that could include information that's actually not even accurate or true, but still it relates to that particular individual. So in summary, it's really important as a first step to consider what's the data involved and actually is there a personal data element. And for generative AI, we might not always have to think about privacy. It's not always necessarily going to be relevant. So for instance, if you're using um, a generative AI for coding as a coding pilot or co-pilot, and you're simply looking at providing um, inputs to generate code for use in software or something like that, then there might not be um, a GDPR element to that particular use case. Um, but naturally, there are going to be many, many scenarios where the GDPR becomes relevant, especially where you don't necessarily have control over what are the inputs and the outputs. And now we're going to think about the second question to help understand how the GDPR may apply. And I'll hand back over to Mark. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And yeah, thanks for that overview of data. Uh, as Richard says, we're going to start thinking about the model and the way we can deploy this. And um, there are a lot of reports in the press around you know, companies who are desperate to deploy. And we've seen that within you know, our own client base. Uh, a number of you, as I said, have have launched solutions more, more recently. Um, we you know, report just this morning's New York Times was talking about uh, yeah, the box CEO, you know, basically saying, look, staff, clear your calendars. We need a gen generative AI. We need to see how this is going to work. Um, and, you know, and as I was saying, a number have thought about how to build that in. They've also thought about how they can take the benefits from this kind of solution within their own businesses. And within, within you know, this sort of generative AI rush or gold rush, we're beginning to see a couple of things. There's almost a market segment of its own building fast. Some of those AI developers, the actual you know, developers of generative AI that are putting it on the market are building this market segment fast. Some of them are new entrants. Some of them are old traditional entrants, the Microsofts and the Googles, who are in the process of launching their own solutions are potentially crashing and destroying other parts of the market in the same process. You know, search may never be the same again. Search advertising and the money derived from search advertising may never be the same again if we're, we're using chat GPT to, 
to search and to find things or curate experiences. I was you know, literally working with my son to look at a, a trip he was considering for Montreal and um, we were using ChatGPT to work out an itinerary over three days or four days. Um, you know, never touched a, uh, a search engine, never saw an advert. Um, there are new ways of finding that information. So advertisers are going to find new ways to to come find us within that uh, within that. And at the moment, of course, that solution is free. So it was subscription um, subscription free. Um, there are some subscription models out there. Others are building their technology into their own models. But um, there are, there are a number of ways of going to market, and um, different ways to market generate different issues. And as Richard was saying, different uses of data generate different issues and have different interpretations, particularly under the GDPR. So the, the, you know, the obvious and simple uh, method of deploying generative AI is um, to develop it yourself and put it on the market. And that's exactly what Google and Microsoft have done. They've built something, they've learned, they've put it on a market, and um, they have a single set of users. And sometimes they may be corporates in a corporate sphere. Sometimes they may be individuals in the individual sphere with you know, different consequences there. But, um, but really, they're in control. I think a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, recently is essentially helping businesses piggyback on some of this technology um, to introduce generative AI into their own products and uh, into the market within the context of their own products, essentially embedding that technology or the technology of another, white labeling it perhaps, um, you know, a powered by a generative AI, but still getting some of that, that control, sometimes potentially under a licensing deal, passing elements of it uh, off as your own or rebranding it. It really depends on the commercial solutions. But in those solutions, we've got different players. And you know, here on the slide, we can see an AI developer, the original model, um, has, you know, they trained that model, and in training that model, they're going to be using that input data, which Richard is talking about. That input data is inevitably going to be containing personal data, processing of personal data under the GDPR is regulated. So the act of collecting, using, learning, and training that model, subject to GDPR and the GDPR's principles, have you know, the questions of notice and the questions of transparency uh, and uh, having lawful basis that we'll, we'll come on to talk on a little bit more in this in this session. But then typically there's a there's a provider uh, in a lot of the models we're seeing underneath, you know, maybe white labeling or embedding or leveraging the technology from that developer. And, and, and those providers are often embedding within their own solution. If they're learning and building their own models or doing their own things around it, they may be a controller, but typically they can be in a processor role. You can use uh, chat GPT as a, uh, a processor acting on your behalf. And further downstream, you'll have different users. They could be your own corporate employees um, or, or staff or personnel who are using it. It could be a field fisher using it to um, uh, augment, our, augment our knowledge services or prepare early research or look at different issues. We would be users in that own right in relation to some of the data we'd be collecting and using. We'd be controller. We'll be deciding what we put in and ask questions on. Uh, but we'll also be getting other inputs back, which may contain personal data. And we'll firmly be in a controller role. Then further down again, if we've got end users using the system that's been spun up, they, they, those data subjects themselves um, you know, could be either you know, a part of the uh, the the, the, the solution and the and the in the general inputs and outputs because you know who hasn't googled themselves well who's put their own reputation into chat gpt to see what chat gpt knows about them i'm still hidden by uh, the famous world um yeah, formula one driver mark weber but my uh, my day will come uh, but yeah in that circumstance i'm i'm a mere data subject my data is going in my data is being used in some circumstances my data has been used as a part of that learning within that massive data, massive data set. So yeah, different roles, and you know, there is no common you know outcome here. We we had various models on this slide um, when we were prepping for this. This and ultimately, you've got to know your role, and as part of knowing your role, as Richard said earlier, you've got to know your data. What data are you using? How are you learning? And what kind of inputs are you taking? 
if you're training, learning, improving your own solution, almost certainly you're going to jump into a controller role. But as a part and parcel of providing a solution to others, you may well be in a processor role if you can isolate, ring fence their data and, uh, and not use it for your own purposes. So a big discussion there. Um, and um, you know, no, no simple cookie cutter answers, but it's not all that difficult when you start to get into that analysis if you understand how these models work. Now, if you understand how these models work is the big, you know, is the big issue. We were really quite surprised just before Christmas to start seeing DPAs coming out from some of these providers and very simple vanilla arm's length service provider relationships with the ability to cut off and isolate because they've done the training separately and they don't necessarily have to train on your data. So yeah, there are ways to use this in relatively simple form. Uh, that doesn't mean that the technology you're using is foolproof and it doesn't mean the technology you're using has been trained in a uh, fully transparent and, and perfect way. And that again is something we'll, we'll come on to in, in following slides. But the model, the model matters. I'm going to hand over to Andrea to talk about how you review those roles and think about those roles, first of all, from a uh, contractual perspective. OK, Andrea, over to you. Yeah, um, thanks, Mark. So, yeah, the f uh, from a privacy perspective, some of the first steps will would be reviewing the roles, as what Mark was mentioning, the contractual terms and conducting appropriate due diligence. Uh, from the perspective specifically of the intermediary provider, uh, you would normally, or what we're seeing in the market is normally these providers are uh, only processors, so they're not uh, using the data for their own machine learning purposes and uh, uh, presenting themselves, themselves with a controller role. So that would, if that's the case, that would facilitate things. Um, you would be conducting a due diligence of the AI developer, which would include reviewing the applicable data protection terms. So which roles uh, is the developer claiming? What assurances are they making regarding data use, data sharing with third parties, data transfers, data security, use of sub-processors if they're claiming to be a processor, uh, among other things. Um, as Mark was mentioning as well, we're seeing some AI developers offering an opt-out from having the content used for product improvement purposes. So this is something you would you should explore and consider exercising or requesting. Um, if the developer is claiming to act as a sub-processor, um, you're required to fall down data protection terms from users. So you would have to update the processor list uh, and ultimately you would remain fully liable to the controller, so to the user for the performance of that sub-processor data protection obligations. Uh, in reviewing the terms with users, um, you would consider in addition to, you know, the data protection considerations, disclaimers to set customer expectations around the risks and limitations of generative AI and appropriately inform customer choices. So this would also include reviewing liability provisions and requiring users to use the features responsibly and abiding by acceptable use policies or similar. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, generative AI models are trained uh, by scrapping, analyzing, and processing publicly available data from the internet. So, uh, and these tools are being used for commercial purposes and the data subjects whose data has been used for the training are completely unaware of this. So there are some inherent data protection, ethical, and IP concerns that you'd want you know, to put forward to users uh, in the terms. Um, and so, from the moving to the user, from the user's perspective, um, as a user and a controller, in addition to conducting due diligence, reviewing roles and contractual terms with the provider, you will also want to start defining an internal policy and being particularly careful with the input and output data. Uh, it's probably safest to just adopt a rule against inputting personal data, but we understand that that's not, that's not going to be possible in many cases. Um, and the same cautions should be applied with respect to confidential information. Um, since using generative AI uh, is likely to result in high risks to individuals' rights and freedoms if you are, are going to be inputting personal data, 
uh, as a controller, you would be legally required to conduct a data protection impact assessment. Uh, and DPIAs are a great exercise. They offer an opportunity to consider how and why you're using AI systems to process the personal data and what the potential risk could be and also identify mitigating measures. Um, as we've been pointing out, uh, there's also other laws, other frameworks at play that don't only concern personal data. So we would suggest considering the DPAA as part of our larger governance framework that would address not only personal data risks, but also, but also non-personal data risks and measures. Um, and particularly considering this is an area of ongoing change, these assessments and frameworks should also be visited on an ongoing basis to make sure you're, you know, keeping up to date with developments and keeping up to date with, you know, risks and measures. And training employees is one of those measures that would be top of mind as part of this framework. Um, now we're going to move uh, to cover some of the issues I haven't pointed out so far in, the, in this uh, slide. So the first one is, for example, transparency and explainability. I've, I've mentioned transparency and explainability with regards, with regards to users, but not with regards to end users. Um, so controllers are required to be transparent about how they process personal data in an AI system. And this means giving individuals information about the processing that's being performed. Um, as noted, there are inherent risks in relation to the training data, and there are additional issues if as a developer, provider, or a customer, or user, you're also learning from new data inputs. Um, the UK ICO has indicated that you should be as upfront as possible about the fact that you're using AI and explain the purposes for using AI. And if the purposes are unclear at the outset, at least give data subjects an indication of what you're doing with their personal data. And as your processing purposes become clearer, then you would be updating and reiterating notices and providing notice, updated notices to data subjects. And here is where the DPIA and the internal, in the internal framework become particularly important as this should be an ongoing process. If you're using AI to make solely automated decision-making about people with legal or sig similarly significant effects, then Article 13 requires controllers to provide meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and the emphasized consequences of such processing for the data subjects. And this can be quite challenging uh, for AI systems as they're black boxes. Um, the UKICO recommends using just-in-time notices and dashboards, which can help keep people informed and let them control further uses of their personal data. We've done a very recently a webinar specifically addressing automated decision making, so we'd suggest you um, find uh, the webinar on our YouTube channel to go more in depth about this topic. Um, and then finally, um, as noted earlier, besides you know all the considerations around privacy and personal data processing, there are other laws and frameworks that concern non-personal data. Um, the AI Act could, you know, it's in draft form, but it could at some point list as high-risk applications, generative AI systems, and introduce new requirements around transparency, explainability, and oversight. So the sooner you start thinking about the implications for non-personal data as well, um, the better you'll be prepared. And obviously, you will, it will be important to keep up to date with um, regulatory um, developments. Um, the next concern and issue and key issue we wanted to discuss is accuracy and bias. Uh, and I'm going to give it to Richard to roll on that one. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrea. So just to spend a couple of minutes talking about issues around accuracy and bias, as a reminder, the GDPR has some fundamental principles to consider here. So it requires accuracy in terms of personal data and also to ensure that personal data is processed fairly and that we always consider fairness and within the context of data protection. And this is a responsibility for the controller involved. They've got to ensure that the data that is processed is accurate. Um, and also that the processing is fair and that it avoids discrimination. Um, now, the issue is that generative AI has been shown to actually produce 
um, many inaccuracies in terms of the responses. Um, and it can also reflect bias and unfairness and discrimination in terms of the content um, that's generated and produced uh, back from its systems. Um, and you know, that's for a number of reasons, and it's mainly due to the fact that it only knows uh, what it knows based on training data, um, and it's also a prediction machine. So its aim is to predict um, the possible response based on input and training and to generate a response. And so there's the old adage, garbage in, garbage out, which is that if it has been trained on data that's inaccurate, um, and that potentially could be the case if it's trained on publicly available information and unreliable sources, then it can potentially learn um, incorrect responses to information and therefore produce inaccurate responses. Not only because the actual data it's learned from might be wrong or incorrect, but there's also this phenomenon around hallucination where as a probabilistic machine, it says, well, what's probably the response and that may produce responses that aren't actually justified based on the training data but is merely it's kind of plausible best guess as what the response might actually be but at the end of the day this leads to potential uh, issues around inaccuracy and similarly with bias some of the responses provided back could actually reflect bias that's been contained within the training data either explicit discrimination stereotypes and bias or due to the fact that the training data was unrepresented for particular classes or persons, or because it uses proxies that actually, um, uh, actually reflect and amplify certain stereotypes or biases. So again, this is a known issue with generative AI. And at this stage, until those issues are fully addressed, um, which might, might be some time away, it's fair to say that generative AI um, isn't necessarily a truth machine. It's, it's experimental tech and it can't necessarily be trusted. So how does that sit within the, the GDPR principles of accuracy and fairness? Um, well, it's, it's to a certain respect, it, can, it considers, well, what's the trade-off here? And some of these tools for generative AI, they might not be used necessarily um, to produce accurate information. They might not necessarily be being used to produce facts about individuals, but you also always need to consider um, uh, where you can actually rely on the responses. Um, so for instance, if you're a provider of this technology, and you're merely acting as in a processor capacity, think about the kind of disclaimers that you're providing to your users about how this technology should be used and its possibility for providing inaccuracies and untrustworthy responses. Similarly, you should also think about an acceptable user policy in terms of, okay, well, how are you gonna be using the responses that are generated. We know that there could be potential issues around misinformation and bias. So then it comes down to how you're actually using the responses and are you using that information in a responsible manner. So um, there are currently some ways you can do, uh, to, you can, uh, methods you can mitigate some of those risks. But at the moment, there is this uh, general clash between these GDPR principles and how the technology operates. And it probably will be some time away before those, that clash is fully resolved. So I'll now hand over to Pardeep and we'll consider another um, challenging area for generative AI, and that is data subject rights. Amazing. Thanks, Richard. Um, as a reminder, the GDPR provides individuals with various data subject rights, such as the right to access, delete, and correct your personal information. In practice, it may be difficult to respond to requests in the context of generative AI, given the way that the personal data is shared with the developer and processed within a black box. So as Richard mentioned earlier, most AI systems are pre-trained using substantial amounts of text, videos, audio, and images, which consist of both personal and non-personal data. The AI system then uses that input data to generate the responses. And in our opinion, we believe that it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to trace and provide a copy of the specific individual's personal data from all the data that is processed by the AI system. And it's difficult to link the personal data to the specific individual to fulfill a access request. Also, as we mentioned earlier, generative AI is trained using a vast amount of data, 
and often the system can learn from inaccurate or false information, which leads to um, generating um, inaccurate responses. So if an individual would like the information to be corrected, it's difficult to implement because the information would need to be corrected within the training data itself. For example, an online article that was used to train the AI system. Also, the challenge for deletion requests is essentially the same for access requests. If you're simply unable to locate and identify the user's information within the black box, then you're not able to delete the information. Also, in regards to the right not to be subject to automated decision making, it really depends on how the AI system is being used. Most, most generative AI systems merely generate text images back to the user, and they don't actually make decisions about the user. However, there could be scenarios where this right becomes more relevant. For example, an advice chatbot that interacts with the user and makes decisions that have a significant effect on the user. However, we believe that it's, not, it's feasible that certain generative AI could make decisions about individuals. However, we expect that this is not relevant for most use cases today. As a summary, we provide um, the best practices. Um, so as a first step, the most important thing is to understand your role and whether you're acting as a developer or an intermediary provider or whether the user. You should also assess whether you're acting as a controller or a processor under the GDPR. Secondly, depending on your role, you should then consider what your responsibilities are as a controller or a processor. For example, as a controller, you need to consider privacy by design principles when incorporating generative AI systems within your products. You also have to address your accountability obligations. So as Andrea mentioned earlier, by conducting a DPIA, which will include a detailed assessment of the possible risks of the AI system and documenting how the personal data will be processed and whether there's any risk to individual rights and which safeguards are used to mitigate these risks. You may also want to consider conducting a human rights assessment, which will ensure that the AI system is deployed in a manner which respects human rights and addresses the human rights concerns raised. For example, you might want to consider, does the AI system adversely affect marginalized and vulnerable people, and what is done to address these concerns? Also, as Andrea mentioned earlier, it is important that you have entered appropriate terms with the other parties. This might include obtaining appropriate assurances and commitments from the provider about its services. It can also include GDPR compliant data processing terms where the provider is acting as a processor on your behalf. Also, you need to ensure that you have appropriate liability terms in place, in particular, given the current risks and uncertainty about the use of generative AI today. Also, another topic that we discussed during this webinar was transparency and explainability of AI. It's really important to explain how the personal data is collected and used and inform your users about any potential risks that are associated with the generative AI system. You can do this by having an accessible and user-friendly privacy notice, which includes information about the individual's personal data, how it's processed, um, which lawful basis is used under the GDPR, and which third parties are involved. Also, it's it's important to include a disclaimer about the potential risks of using the AI system and whether there's a possibility of inaccurate and false responses. Also, include a health warning which urges users not to share sensitive information, such as their race, ethnicity, or health data, whilst they're interacting with the AI system. Finally, it is important to implement clear practices, policies, procedures, and have the right documentation in place regarding the use and implementation of the AI system and ensure your teams have effective training on AI deployment, de sorry, AI development and its usage. So fantastic. Thank you very much, Hardy. Um, and also to Richard and to Andrea. Um, really good sort of in-depth dive into generative AI there. Um, we will make the deck available. We are recording this and uh, the recording will be available too if anybody out there wants um, to, to share with colleagues, etc. But um, just want to thank you all for joining us.
Next up, most likely on Wednesday the 19th of April, we're going to be looking at the privacy issues around the use of employers of record and um, a couple of colleagues will be joining us just to talk uh, talk through some of those issues of the, the new model of international expansion and some of the challenges we're seeing there. But um, thank you to everyone for joining us today and um, we're really, really pleased to um, yeah, see so many show up. Uh, I think Hardy, Richard, Andrew and I will get back to the data map for 300 billion different data inputs that we're working on and uh, uh, we might see you sometime in 2024. So um, thanks very much and uh, good luck with the rest of your days. Thank you.